Cool. Well, thanks everyone for uh, making the time to come along to my talk. I know it's been uh, probably a big three days or two days so far of talks and things. I appreciate you coming along to the, or five days, I guess, if you did the workshops. <laughs> so you guys are the real superheroes doing that many days of things in a row. Uh, what I'm going to run through is essentially comic book layouts through the ages and how we can convert those into sort of modern front end or using modern front end techniques to recreate those layouts because comic books started fairly basic and I think our layout started fairly basic and they've gotten a lot more complex. But I, I think we've missed some of the areas where we've realised that we can create some of that complexity in our front ends. So something that you probably didn't think you were going to get in coming to NDC Oslo is a little bit of a history of <laughs> comic books. So uh, they're said to have passed through four ages, uh, with each of those ages said to have had something sort of distinctive about it. We were first introduced to the superhero archetype in the golden age of comics. This was approximately 1938. And it was introducing us to characters like Superman, Wonder Woman and Batman. During the Silver Age, the world is recovering from a world war and a lot of the readers had matured during that time. So to meet that maturity, the writers had to change their sort of approach. Stories that focused on horror, uh, crime and romance became popular and it essentially helped that survive through what is a difficult period in history. So after the Silver Age used many of the heroic storylines writers could think of, the Bronze Age instead focused on social issues of the day. Bigotry, uh, substance abuse and racism were more the focus of those stories. And then stepping into the modern age, kind of where we are now, it's a time of redesign, growth and disruption by the web, by us. Anyone is now able to publish comics, and I'm sure a lot of us have read things that weren't done by those major publishers. So no longer was it about those sort of one or two significant people or players or industries, anyone could do it. So what makes comic books an absorbing storytelling medium that along with the great characters, storylines and art styles is the impact that the layout itself can have on the story. And we're going to explore each of the ages as it relates to uh, the web layout and how CSS Grid, when we combine it with other techniques, can be used to recreate some of these layouts. So the following examples, they are for comics, but when you're looking at them, think about how they can apply to what you're working on now. These aren't exclusively for comics. Um, and I don't particularly go into responsive grids here because... A lot of people have covered that. This is more of a journey of sort of inspiration rather than diving right into every aspect of how to make a grid. So combine those comic book ages span about 70 years. And that's a long time to evolve how they tell their stories and how they do layout. In comparison, our web is relatively young, or our industry, sorry, is relatively young. HTML is about 29 years old and CSS is 25. So that makes me older than both of them. Uh, not combined, thankfully, but that's where I'm at with the industry. <laughs> so the point that I'm getting that to here, though, is that in a relatively short period of time, layout in the web has progressed through many ages of its own. We started with HTML, basic text, basic links. We started to use tables for what they weren't intended for and started opting them into layouts. We did some weird things there. The first of our comic crossovers, we had Flash, very dynamic but problematic in other ways. And we went through absolute float, responsive is kind of where we're at. And then intrinsic, which is one of the reasons I don't dive too much into uh, responsive now because we have devices that fold out and we have so many different form factors now that just having a bunch of media queries doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have the best layout. So we need to be a little bit more flexible in the way that we do things. 
And all of that in just 29 short years, less than half of that of our friends from the comic industry. So it can be tempting at times to give Lau on the web a hard time. I'm sure we've heard the joke of how difficult vertical centering can be. But I think it's amazing how far we've progressed. So we can appreciate where we are when we consider where we have come from. So is the current age going to be considered the web's modern age? And I think with CSS Grid, that might just be the case. So just quickly before we jump into that, this is me, Anton. I'm one of the probably surprising amount of Australians, particularly from Perth, that you've heard speak here or seen here. Uh, made the way all the way up with my family, so that was a lot of fun. I originally started uh, my career in graphic design, but transitioned into development uh, just because, I don't know, I found it more interesting for me. Uh, so as you know, I'm older than HTML and CSS, but not combined. So that gives you an idea of uh, how long I've been going as a developer. I'm the full stack team lead at Doist, better known for Todoist, but also working on Twist as well. It's kind of Slack with boundaries. You can find me on Twitter at AntonJB if you uh, have any of that, and a lot of the links are kind of on there. And this is perhaps sort of superfluous information at this point, but I quite enjoy comics. So let's jump into the first age. Undoubtedly, uh, one of the most important comics in history is Action Comics number one. It is the introduction to Superman, who is holding the car there. Now, They've changed a lot throughout the years, but this is essentially where they started. The layout throughout the comic, and many really through the Golden and Silver Age, we're kind of combining them here, consisted primarily of squares and rectangles. We can see that in these pages here. But as this talk is going to be focused more on layout, let's strip out the imagery and see what we're left with. The pattern was one to three panels per row staggered throughout the page with a semi-consistent gap. You know, it was printing of before, so, you know, semi-consistent. And I think in terms of CSS Grid, it's a nice starting example. You might, if you've used Grid, think that we could do something along the lines of Grid, Template, Row, repeating three times with one fraction. But we want that staggering where each panel is a little bit off from the other one, so we have to go a little bit further with it. Now, the way that I calculated the columns is to measure the smallest panel that we could possibly do. That's the, orange, uh, the one with 36 pixels there. We're not going to make one that size, but it is technically the smallest one we could have. And dividing it by the entire width of the, co of the page, so which is 576. Now, these are very absolute values, but we're uh, doing it just so that we can calculate the number of columns we would need. So with that dividing, we get the 16 columns that we're going to need, and this is giving us the same ratio as the printed version. Putting that into some code terms with CSS, we have display grid, grid template columns, repeating 16 times with one fraction, and we can be a lot more precise with our gap with 12 pixels. We're not needing to set the rows here if with grid template rows because we can rely on what's called the implicit grid to handle that for us. Uh, so if, you, if we're not familiar with the implicit grid, it, if content is added that's going to fall outside of the defined grid range, so our defined grid was the top row, grid will automatically add new tracks to contain that content. Now by default, implicit grid tracks are automatically sized. And we do have the ability to change that with grid auto rows. So you might want one to be one size and then have others a different size. But for our case, we're happy for it just to be auto because we're just adding similar panels in there. So each panel can then span the number of columns that we need. So panel one with grid column span six across grid column two spans, five, so on, so forth, and they'll keep wrapping around. And there we go. We've had a nice little grid example uh, and just a few lines of code. But we're probably not feeling kind of, I don't know, too super heroic just yet in these layouts, right? And the layout in Action Comic 1's never played much of a part in the story itself. It's more just being used as a container to tell those stories. 
But moving forward to the Bronze Age brought with it a change in how layout could become a part of the story itself. So Spider-Man 121 is released in 1973. It's considered a pivotal point in this character's story. Now, I hope it's not a spoiler for something that was released in 1973, but it is the death of Gwen Stacy. If you've seen any of the new movies, you'll be familiar. They keep this sort of repeating through time. At the time in comics, it was permanent, as we know... <laughs> Nothing is changed, it all changes now. But what's great about this story, along with the moment, artwork and characters, is the way that the layout was an integral part of its telling. So the height of the bridge here and the fall is shown much more dramatically by the way that it's spanning multiple rows. Now we don't get that effect in the other ones. So even though this is a great moment, in terms of, in terms of storytelling, Let's again strip out the artwork to see the layout pattern that they were using here. So the big difference is the panel spanning multiple rows, the ones where the bridge was in and the fall was shown. And this is one of the areas where Grid has given us a true sense of modern layout. No longer are we constrained to a single axis, uh, axis like we might be with flex or other techniques. So the determining the columns was done the same way that we did in our previous uh, comic, but turning that into code, we have our grid repeating 23 with one fraction. Now we're still able to rely on the implicit grid here, even though we're spanning multiple rows. Grid is sort of powerful enough to help figure that out for us. So with that, we have panel one, which is spanning nine across but then we span three down. And because it's the first one, it's automatically going to fill up that area. Panel two, we're just spanning across. We only need it to sit there, and panel three would do the same. And panel four, because that spot would be taken, it automatically goes down, and we can make it span multiple rows. So we've had, with what we have now, we're able to cover most of the comics up to the Bronze Age. So next up, in our journey through the ages is one called Watchmen. It's famous for many reasons, but one is that it's considered to have kicked off the modern age of comics. And uh, something interesting about Watchmen is that it kind of didn't do what uh, uh, Spider-Man did in that it stuck to a pretty strict nine panel grid. And that means that everything that we've done so far could actually recreate this entire comic. And I'm um, I'm not advocating that we all do nine panel grids. I think the, the joy of grid is the flexibility that it gives us. But there was something else that was done in Watchmen, which is why it's made it into this talk that was quite interesting and sort of a little outside the box of what we've seen so far. The artwork in the second row, which I've sort of uh, enhanced <laughs> to sit to the side there, has an image that's spanning across every panel. Most of the time each panel has had its own image. This one has one image that's spanning across. Now, it would be simple enough for us to split that image into three and be done with it. But I think it's better if we can recreate this effect while maintaining the image itself. It will give us flexibility, say if we want to change the image later, we're not going to have to remember how we did that, we've just got the one image and one size that we can do, and we can swap it out. And I think it's also, I do touch a little bit on responsiveness here, despite what I said at the start. <laughs> It'll help us if we want to work with that. So we've got a little setup here for our grid, but the aim is to have the image retain its size and the thing while adding the gap in itself. So we wrap panel three in a div and we set it to display grid. So the comic is similar to what we've had already and the overlap is a grid spanning two so that it goes across and the panel three spans all the way across. We're just filling in the space. So only the direct children of container with grid defined, with display grid defined, will become grid items. But with subgrid, something that's fairly new, we can inherit the rows or columns of the parent element. And that's what happens here when we are setting the grid template columns to subgrid. So we have our main grid, and then which has a columns of repeat to auto, and then overlap is inheriting that from the parent. 
So overlap inherits the column from comic, applying it then to itself. If the column in comic changes size, and this is kind of why we've done it, if we were to add another panel in there or do something different to move it, the one below is going to do the same thing. But we don't have to inherit the whole grid either. So all we've done here is inherit it for the columns, but we've left the rows defining it ourselves. And why that might be useful in a comic sense is say we were adding speech bubbles or other little elements, but you can think as well about how in regular web products we might do something different. So putting the graphics back in, it's time to achieve the gap itself. So we're going to use a pseudo element here on overlap. We give it the content so it appears. With our outline, we're using a CSS custom property here called grid gap so that we can keep it consistent if we change anything. And we give it the same color and we put it into grid row one, column one. So we're, we're effectively adding that gap ourselves, but it means that we can keep the image intact. And this is where I mentioned that we can, that will be helpful when we're doing something with responsiveness. So it's ticked off our goal of maintaining the image while we simulate the gap. And if we were to drop it down, we might want to get rid of that gap. It might be a bit small at this case, so we can get rid of it. So subgrid is a really great next step for grid. Anytime you've struggled to align items without setting a height across multiple panels, this is where we've, this is going to be the solution to that problem. So I imagine a lot of us have done the thing where we've got three cards that might be a pricing page and you've got two cards that only have a little bit of content and then that third one's like a short novel and it pushes everything out and we've got to try and align everything and you know you want the buttons to align, it's quite difficult. And this is an example from the Todoist website. So you, you may have experienced this trade-off. If you use height, like we have in the first, and I, I switched to uh, German, which tends to be a little bit longer than English to sort of help illustrate it. Um, if you use height, you risk some of the content being cut off. So that's really problematic for the users. We've got the button there, which I believe says, per oh, doesn't matter, it's, uh, that's what it says. Uh, you risk cutting off something. But if you use min height, then we get into the design issue where it's not as nice when it's not lining up. This is where grid and subgrid is going to have us covered. If the middle row content that's between our subgrid grows, then so too will the rest of them. And we can finally have a nice area where content will stay the same and buttons will line up. The advantage over the flat grid setup is that we get the flexibility of the expanding row in the middle while we maintain sort of nice semantic HTML meaning, being able to wrap each of the cards in the appropriate element. Where's browser support at with subgrid though? Yeah, uh-oh. Uh, we're a little bit in experimental territory here uh, with subgrid, I'll be honest, as you can see, there's, we lost a lot of people there, more than half. The only browser with subgrid sort of fully implemented uh, is Firefox, and that was interestingly all the way back in 2019. And then Safari recently enabled subgrid in their technical preview release, so it, I would expect it to land soon. Safari's actually been making a lot of leaps and bounds, they've, they've kind of become the IE for a little while there, but that was probably quite unfair. Uh, but there's hope with this. Subgrid was included in Interop 2022. Uh, what Interop is, is a combined effort by browser vendors and other sort of companies that work on browser features to get to feature parity with everything there. So make sure all the tests pass the same and everything works the same across the browsers. Have less of that problem of like, oh, IE is doing this and Firefox is doing that. I mean, IE, that was a weird example because that's gone, but Chrome and Firefox, etc. So keep an eye on the Interop 2022 progress and you can see how far along uh, subgrid goes. And <laughs> once Chrome has it, then we're, we're looking pretty good because then um, Edge and the rest of them have it or whoever, whichever one of them adds it. 
So before subgrid is more widely available though, we can create this effect using display contents. Adding display contents to overlap effectively gets rid of that div and moves it up into the grid itself. And we can achieve the same thing. And you, and you might be thinking, well, why don't we just do that anyway? Um, as I said, there's the advantages of subgrid where we can get everything growing, but we also lose a semantic meaning when we do that. Now, in the comic example, it was a bit harder to get semantic meaning, but if we had something in there like a header or an aside or something that had that semantic meaning, we lose that. And there was initially some problems with accessibility, but browsers have uh, thankfully sorted that out. But depending on how far back you're going with support, it's something to keep in mind. Uh, so it's the next evolution here it, during the modern age of comics where layout again became unique and interesting. Uh, we're going to revisit Spider-Man because well, I like it, um, one of my favourite sort of series, but we started to see a new layout trend in this age of comics. This modern age brought with it layering panels to sort of achieve a flow and depth that we hadn't previously seen. Artists were able to focus in and provide little details without sort of it having to be its own little specific panel. And I'm sure layering isn't new to the web and I'm sure you've had to sort of overlay a modal or something like that. And we, the way that we've had to do that could be a little imprecise or a little hacky at times. Grid is going to give us a much more predictable sort of way of doing that. So let's again look at a code. Up to now we have been relying on that implicit grid to just magically do some of the things for us. But we're going to need to be explicit with the rows and columns here of our grid. Now, if you're at the JavaScript sort of quizzes the other days, you might be looking at some of these numbers and thinking, what on earth is happening? The values, uh, they're looking a little intimidating, but here's how I figure them out. It's not so bad once you kind of do it. Because we have the artwork available, which we often do, right? It, it's rare that sort of we haven't either designed something or the designer hasn't given up, supplied that to us. We can draw the shape of the grid and see how it fits. So we're going to focus first on the rows. Now there's multiple ways, like all things, to do this. But if we divide the height by the number of rows that we're going to need, each of those lines is going to be a row that we are needing to position something at. It's either usually the start of the image or the end of the image that we're going to be creating. And again, we're dividing that by the number of, of those that we have, which gives us 109. It's just what we're using for a base fraction. We could have just picked one image and used that as our base fraction. This is just the approach that I've taken. It's worth playing around with. So dividing that by the height of an individual row with that base fraction, so our first uh, image is 291 pixels, we divide that by 109 and it gives us 2.6 fractional units. So uh, why do I keep using these fractional units here instead of percentages? And we have flexibility when we need to make everything responsive while maintaining the aspect ratio of each of the panels. When we have a grid gap as well, if we're using percentages, the fractions will take into account the gap. Whereas if we start to use percentages, things are going to start to explode out the side. You know, we start to get that CSS is awesome uh, meme where everything's popped out the side. So it works in nicely with those. It's a, it's a nice technique with it. And we repeat that same fr uh, sort of approach for each of the columns. And that's how we ended up there. So we can then layer our panels over the top where needed using grid row and the grid column values. So panel 3, we have grid row 4 through to 7. Grid column 5, we have fi uh, column 5 and we span it one across and we give it z-index because we need it to, to sit on top. Panel 4, we have grid row 5 through to 9 and then we do grid column 2 to negative 2. And I think it's right to wonder, well, where, where's negative two come from in this whole thing? We haven't seen that yet. It's another handy technique that Grid has given us to be able to position uh, items. So the grid lines are numbered from one through to n. Each of the lines that we defined gets a number. n in our case is eight. We had eight sort of um, 
lines, grid columns. So our starting line for panel four is two. That's where we wanted it, two in. The lines are also numbered from, in this case, right to left or backwards. So we want, we know that that one is going to be coming in two spaces from what is our end. And I, I'm sort of trying to avoid direction because internationalization comes into this in a little bit. So we want to be two in from the side. And why this is useful is if we were to say have our thing there and we added another couple of columns in, we would have to go back and adjust everything. But if as long as it's within that, it's just going to adapt and stretch to that. Again, we're talking about being a bit more flexible and intrinsic design. And the beauty of most of the browser tools now is it's going to show you these numbers. So uh, jump into the browser, define your grid, inspect it, and you'll get to see these. You can also, which is, I don't cover it too much here, but it's worth looking into, you can name areas. So an area, as we said, is sort of one of the panels, or we can have multiple panels, and you can give it a string value and start to name your things. Really useful when you have sort of a header or a sidebar and things like that. When they're named, it's really handy worth following up sort of after this talk. So the modern age of comics made prolific use of this layering and it can be a great way to finally break out of the boxes that have contained web design for so long. This is another example here which is Hawkeye number one from Marvel City, it doesn't matter, along with the web recrea recreation at the sign. We're not using gap here, we're throwing on a bit of a thick border and, and just simulating a lot of things. But again, like it's just giving us more depth and interest to what we can do. To keep with the themes of comics and to keep borrowing from our friend Spider-Man, with great power though comes great responsibility. Layering is an exciting sort of addition to our tool set, but we have to consider more than just the layout it is opening up to us. There's an inherent danger that if I can just move that panel somewhere else, and we'll do so, if the source code isn't ordered in the way that, say, a screen reader is going to read it, we're going to negatively impact the accessibility of our project. So if we were to move our panel 4 from the mid section where we have up to the top, because we're like, okay, we're making a change, this is more of what we wanted, and it's looking a bit better. We need to remember and consider the source code order as well. Solely changing the visual layout does not tell the browser that the source order has changed. And this could lead to problems when, as someone who is, can see it and can digest the content, I will get a different story then someone who is using assistive technologies will get because that panel is still considered to be down where it was before. So we can do it, just consider everyone when doing so. There's ways that we can avoid falling into this trap though. We start with the structure of the document first. We create that out. We add our C CSS grid onto that. And like any hero, we then be vigilant. When we're making changes and doing maintenance, we make sure that we keep those things in mind. Um, MDN, great resource for reading into CSS grid accessibility if you want to have a bit more of a look into that. Of course, they have lots of great articles and resources there. So a common criticism of web and layout in general is that everything is within this box. Sometimes you may have heard it called sort of bootstrap layouts where everything starts to look a little bit the same. And these are techniques that have allowed us to work quite quickly at the cost of a bit of creativity. And so far the pages we've looked at have also been quite boxy. Even though we've been laying things over each other, they're still all in boxes. For comics, boxy layouts started to change during the modern age of comics as well. The characters broke out of their boxes and the storytelling once again evolved with that change. So this is a nice example from Phoenix and Jean Grey showing how different shapes can enhance the storytelling and 
the web recreated version beside it. So that's working in the browser. Now fundamentally, everything is still within a box. You can't sort of get away from that. We can't do L shapes in grid or shapes like this. But with some sort of CSS tricks and techniques, we can get creative and give the illusion of almost any shape we like. So there's uh, a little bit of boilerplate that we're going to do here. It's similar to the others where our container is holding everything in place. We have the background image and doing that and overflow hidden because we're going to be doing some funky moving and we don't want it to get out of our box, ironically. The panel grid has columns for each of the five panels and we can't see all five here but they are all there but they're all overlapping each other and the reason is with this technique what we're doing is essentially cutting away the parts of the image that we don't want shown. So they're all still there and they're overlapping but when we want the other part of the image to show through we're just going to remove that part of it. Hopefully this helps to sort of illustrate that. Each of them is layered on top of each other in a different way and sitting within the grid. Now our panel container is then rotated and put into place along the bottom and we're starting to give it that curve that we're going for. Uh, transform rotate and translate there are going to be doing that with the absolute positioning which is why we had some of that boilerplate code. So clip path is what is going to give us the shape that we're after. When you add a clip path rule, like what we've done here with our, our cat friend, we have the clip path polygon and we have x, y values that will make their way around the image into effectively whatever shape we like. And we apply that to each of our panels and we're getting pretty close. Now we're, <laughs> we're looking at all these weird values again saying like, why do these weird values keep coming up and how does he sit there and calculate them? I don't. Uh, in this case, this is Firefox and we put a clip path onto it just in a random shape and then in the panel there, you can click on that little icon and it will show you the nodes that you've added and I can drag them around and then you can double click onto it which will add a new node and you can move it and you can see that those values are updating in the dev tools. Copy that value and <laughs> take it back into uh, whatever tool you use. Lean on the browser tools, that's what they're there for. The white border is achieved by essentially uh, we take, so we've got the panel uh, containing the image excuse me, and we give that a white background and so the image inside we just shrink it down a little bit and give it the same clip path. We can't use grid gap here because we're not in any kind of grid anymore. Now this is probably a downside of this technique is that we're manually having to manage all of this. So th there's downsides of course. Uh, but it looks cool, right? So we've got our transform scale which shrinks it down a little bit and you'll notice the transform origin at the bottom there. Because of the funky shapes and the way that we're doing that, we just need to change where we're transforming it from to keep it within the container. A lot of this is just changing lots of values in the browser tools until it looks right. And there we go. We've recreated the shapes from that comic and made a really unique layout. This is not something that you're often going to be seeing when looking at the web. And if uh, you haven't seen it yet, each of the examples have a code pen link uh, underneath them or around them. So feel free to, uh, sorry, I have a link later on which links to all of them. So don't feel like you need to desperately <laughs> take a photo. But there are examples for each of them. This thing is murdering my ear. Sorry. Um, so clip path is no doubt a powerful tool when combined with grid uh, and we'll take a look at another example here, Detective Comics 876 aka Batman. So taking the grid and the layering and everything that we've looked at we could recreate this layout. The drawing is a little more intense but it's the sort of not the background with the city and not Batman, it's that middle part of the squares that is kind of interesting here and what I wanted to focus on. We can add Batman with layering later. 
The shapes can be created by adding a little bit of perspective and rotating the panel itself. So our panel one, we have our grid row, gr grid column, we're doing the positioning which we've kind of seen. We transform with perspective, that's going to give us some of that new sort of angles and shapes. And we can rotate and transform it and then panel two similar as well. But what you can hopefully see in the example that I put here is that the blue from each of them is overlapping through and that's not what was happening in the comic. It all looked like one sort of shape going down the page. Again, we can solve that with our friend Clip Path. Clip Path is setting the area that is visible, not the area that's not visible. So our panel three here, we add the Clip Path on and again, I did it in the browser. I drew around the things and got the shape that what I wanted removed what I didn't, and now we have recreated that same shape. Each of those panels is going down and we have pretty similar to what the comic had without having any of the things coming through and it's a little bit funky. Now get ready for this one. It's not limited to just polygons. Here's an example of Flash uh, comic with I've swapped sides here, I've, with the web recreation at the start, and I really like what happened, where's my pointer, with these two cats. It looks a bit like Two-Face <laughs> with these two cats. I'll show on this side, them. I enjoyed that. Uh, it's a chaotic scene, um, and so that's why I've just put cats in there, because I was like, I don't know how to get images that are going to fit in this. It's the same as everything else, and so if we break it down, we've covered polygon already, there's other shapes that we can use with clip paths. We have ellipse, where we can define a radius with an X and a Y value to do the positioning. Um, the second, yeah, that's what the second two are for that. Uh, and then circle for uniform shape. So that other one was just done by piling a lot of them on top of each other. So clip path affected the shape of the container, but we also have we can also have text react to the container's shape using CSS shapes. So this is a panel from the comic series Saga. We can see the text starting to wrap around the edge of the planet. Now you've probably seen this in magazines many times. It's existed in there for as long as probably magazines have existed but it provides a little more interest than the regular squarish speech bubbles that what we have. So setting the shape outside of the image is where we get this from. Panel one, we're doing just positioning again, it's, it's boilerplate things. The paragraph, paragraphs, excuse me, we're positioning it where we need it. And then panel, the image itself, we're floating it to where we need it. We've got the width and the height and the new part that we're looking at here is shape outside with the circle. So it's similar to what we've seen. Now again, the browser tools. Firefox has been helping. I think they've got really great browser tools. You can click that button. It will show you the shape that you've done and you can start to adjust it. And it also, I like that you can see what's happening. I, I tend to be quite a visual sort of learner and doer and I like just being able to see something quite quickly. I'm really happy with how th the browser tools have been uh, helping this sort of work. Uh, it's really nice to be able to do that. It takes a lot of the guesswork out of it. So the shapes can be more complex than just circles. If for whatever reason the designer comes to you one day and says, we've got a cat and we need the text to wrap around it. You're like, I saw this at NDC Oslo. I've got you covered. We can do the same polygon shape that matches the cat's face. Uh, something that wasn't in clip path that we can do with the sh is, sorry, something that wasn't in clip path that we can do with shape outside is an alpha mask. So we have an alpha shape of our cat in this case, and similar to when you're doing a background image in CSS, you can set the URL to that. There are some cores considerations to have here, but I, I don't know why you would be hosting this alpha mask somewhere else. It's, it would likely be within your thing, but it's something that's often pointed out in the documentation is the cause consideration for our cats, uh, our cats, for the images. So what we've created so far is 
great examples of the modern web, but it is a Western modern web. It's following those same structures and those same styles. Now at Todoist, you know, at Doer, sorry, with our products, we're supporting 19 different languages and that comes with it, different reading styles and different approaches. For, for I guess, myself, uh, that's typically left to right, top to bottom. That is not the only comic book style, though, either. In, for instance, Japan has their manga industry, their comics. Now, I've been a fan of Naruto, so it's fun that I keep getting to use things that I'm interested in in these talks, but this is the same page from the manga in Japanese and the English translation on the side. Now, this start is, for me, what would be considered the opposite side of the page, running in sort of a mirrored direction. The bottom is down in how I'm looking at it here, the bottom left. When they translate it to English, they don't change it around, they keep it like that. So if you've ever happened to buy one of these, you'll open it up and there's usually a page that says, nope, start at the other end of the book and you flip it around. The beauty of the web is we can be a little bit more flexible with that. When placed into the grid with the left to right direction, it will display in, for my case, what I'm used to reading, left to right, top to bottom. Thankfully, CSS Grid has us fairly well covered and we can just use a property of right to left and everything just changes the other way around. I mentioned before that with the source code order it being so important, you might be tempted initially if you were to be doing this to move the source order, but then we've got to remember to our screen reader and assistive technology friends, w if we were to do that, they might be getting two, three, one, six, five, four, et cetera, and the, the story is not making sense at that point. And this is the beauty of some of these modern layout techniques is we can lay it out in the logical source order and then grow the layout from there to support as many people as possible. Of interest in this comic and a little bit outside of internationalization, you'll notice though that the grid gap is different. The original comic had this spacing as well. Grid enables you to have a different vertical and horizontal layout for it. It's two rem is the uh, vertical, one rem being the horizontal. So I just thought that might be of interest to point out. A lot of the time I just set the one, but you do have flexibility there. Also worth noting in the manga version is the direction of the text itself. So it's top to bottom running uh, from my right to left. Whereas in English, in this case, it's still got that right bit, but it's left to right going down. Now, I avoided writing it in Japanese. Um, oh, my text is gone. But we can do this with vertical, setting the writing mode vertical right to left, and that will set the text in there. I don't know why it's disappeared. I'll check that later. Unfortunate timing. Uh, but with a logo graphic text, it will handle that properly. When it's in English, it just kind of writes it sideways going down, which again can be useful if you're doing something specific with the design. But for a logo graphic text element, it will work as you're kind of expecting it to there. Arabic is another one that sort of does that as well. So that brings us to the uh, end of our journey through the ages of comics and how they can be brought to the web. And oops, I mentioned at the start that although the comics or the layouts I'm talking about are all very comic based, do think about how you can use a lot of their techniques for what you're working on now. They are very extensible and flexible to that. I hope the effects that demonstrated throughout the talk have sparked some ideas and interest in and showing that the web doesn't need to just be boxy and square so much as it is. I'd love to see kind of where you take this beyond just comics and this talk for what people create. Feel free to share it with me if there's anything that kind of you do after this. We've been in those boxes for quite some time <laughs> and I imagine when you apply these layouts to your projects, some great things will happen. And that's why I believe we're now in the modern age of layout on the web. 
CSS Grid has given us great powers and flexibility with our layout. We saw how we could stagger the content, layer our panels to create depth and interest. The coming CSS Grid spec level two with subgrid, I think is just around the corner and will help solve so many of those little niggles that we have with front end design now across multiple panels and things like that. You, we do it all the time getting a little more creative and breaking outside the boxes with the CSS clip path, CSS shapes, uh, and the shape outside, and making our projects to as accessible to as wide an audience as possible with Grid's great support for internationalization. If you are interested in the code examples, you can find them at CodePen at this collection. Feel free to play with them, share with them, fork them, do whatever. Um, I'll delay a little bit while people take photos. I've also got a link on my Twitter uh, for that if you happen to miss it. <laughs> Just I'll take this chance to... If reading is more your approach, and, and particularly because it can be hard to get into all the depth of uh, something like this in, in a short form uh, talk, each of those sections that I went through are in blog post form on uh, my website. So you can go into each one of those techniques in greater detail if you so choose. And if you, again, you have questions, feel free to ask them. Stanley had a famous catchphrase that he would often sign off his letters with, which was Excelsior. And I thought it would be a great little hat tip to him uh, and what he's done for comics and likely many creative industries with <laughs> kind of signing off the talk in the same way. Uh, but I looked up the meeting, uh, meaning, pardon me, which is ever upward. And I thought that was nice for a conference to take away what you learned today from all the talks or over the multiple days and take our industry upwards. Thanks very much. And if you have any questions, feel free.